Good afternoon and welcome to the New York State Museum. This is our brain food for the curious talk lecture today. And um, just to kind of give you a little overview, as our young republic searched for an, an identity, leaders often looked to ancient Rome and ancient Greece in nu numerous ways. The obvious one is our fundamental documents and governing organizations, but emulation carried over to culture as well. Place names like Cicero, Camillus, Odessa, all in New York State, uh, city plans and layouts, decorative arts and architecture were all classically inspired and especially here in New York State. Lauren Lyons, the New York State Museum Chartering Coordinator and Assistant to the New York State Historian is here to discuss this topic specifically focused on Albany's architecture titled Building Legitimacy, New York State Architecture and Its Classical Grandeur. And I'm gonna turn everything over to Lauren. Thank you. Uh, my name is Lauren Lyons. And as Jennifer said, I work in the Office of State History as the Chartering Coordinator and Assistant to the State Historian. So today I'll be presenting on neoclassical architecture in post-revolutionary New York. This research began while I was an undergrad and carried into my graduate work and still holds interest to me today. Um, I began looking at the use of classical forms and symbols as a way to denote political power or um, political intention, but with a particular focus on the creation of our state capital. So I've extended some facets of my research to include areas in New York outside of Albany and to expand past just the political to also include civics, uh, religion, private residences, and the military within New York's early Republic society. So following the American Revolution, the United States found itself in a unique position. Uh, now that the nation had achieved independence, how could they prove that they deserved a place on this wider world stage amongst long-standing, all-powerful European nations? How could they justify the revolution that they had just gone through and declare to the world entire that this infant nation would continue to be a promising, stable republic that would exist for the long run? They decided to evoke ancient civilizations that had been lauded for their democratic ideals, namely ancient Greece and ancient Rome. These evocations themselves um, appeared throughout American art, architecture, literature, and numerous other areas of society. By comparing themselves to the last great republics, the United States could legitimize their existence. And this ph phenomenon, looking through this neoclassical lens, really took America by storm. Um, the 1780s and the 1830s saw an incredible burst in neoclassical architecture and New York exemplified this wider national aesthetic trend. Both public and private buildings adopted classical motifs, municipalities were named for Roman heroes and cities and official seals were replete with classical imagery and names. So before delving into the architecture itself, I thought that we could go over some classical symbol, symbols frequently used to call to these ancient civilizations. The list is exhaustive, so I've identified some of the most prevalent, including the eagle, lion, columns, globes, and the toga. So eagles were a symbol of power, uh, strength, leadership, and commonly attributed to the Roman god Jupiter, who was the king of the gods and emblematic of power and victory himself. We'll see later on that personifications of Greek and Roman gods and goddesses um, were also used extensively within these neoclassical buildings, um, as well as um, other forms of imagery. Lions, like eagles, were a symbol of power, but they also denoted victory, bravery, vigilance, and fortitude. Globes represented imperial rule, and columns and domes popular in ancient architecture alluded to temporal and spiritual aspirations and power. The personifications of virtues and ideals like liberty, justice, 
um, were and still are depicted in ancient garb, namely togas. There are also depictions of the founding fathers and other famous figures from the time that might be depicted in art statues um, in the same way, wearing ancient garb. Uh, common to, uh, terms, excuse me, used within the political world also harkened back to the classical world. Uh, capital and senate, senate are two such words, the former being derived from the word capitoline, where the Roman temple to the aforementioned god Jupiter was located. On to the architecture. So neoclassical architecture or new classical architecture found prominence across the US as well as the wider European world in the 18th and 19th centuries. In the United States, this umbrella term neoclassical can be split into two further categories, federal or Greek revival. Federal architecture was prominent from 1780 to 1820 and was modeled more on Roman architectural ideals. This style related on Palladian austerity symmetrical exteriors, smaller pediments, which is the triangular um, shape usually above an entrance in these buildings, um, generally above the domes, almost uh, an overhang to a porch. Um, and arches would highlight windows. Brick was a popular choice, but not an exclusive material for this type of look. Whereas Greek revival architecture was popular between the years 1820 and 1840, and evoked Greek architectural standards. Greek revival commonly featured grand columned porticos and larger pediments crowning the tops of buildings and were characterized by white exteriors. My personal favorite building um, to look at within New York neoclassical architecture is the old Capitol building. It was built between the years 1804 and 1806, following the design of Philip Hooker, who was a prominent Albany architect at the time. He went on to design numerous buildings across the state, but we'll look at some of those later on. Um, so this old Capitol building, which you see an illustration of here, was, uh, it featured 33 foot tall columns across, across the front facade as well as a large triangular pediment exemplifying these neoclassical traits. Inside the building, there were American eagles presiding over state rooms and crowning the cupola atop the building, which you can see here, was an 11 foot statue of Thamus, who was the Greek goddess of divine justice and an influence on the personification of justice that we see today, frequently outside of courthouses or on, um, judicial seals. Um, unfortunately, this building no longer exists. It's uh, where Capitol Park currently is, uh, right here in Albany. The building was demolished in 1833, um, just as the new state capitol was being inaugurated. And prior to the demolition day, the statue of Themis was meant to be removed and placed in the new capital, but nights before the demolition, there was a severe thunderstorm. And at some point during the night, uh, the statue had toppled from on top of the building and crashed into the sidewalk and was no longer whole enough to be used in the new capital. So looking at the new capital as sort of a distantly connected tangent. The old capital was used for approximately 70 years until the current capital building that we see today was inaugurated. The old capital building became too small for what it was meant to, to function as and designs were submitted for the capital building we see today. And as anyone who's seen the current capital knows, the similarities between the two are few and far between. The current building, not neoclassical, it's built in a Romanesque revival or a neo-Renaissance style. However, the current building was meant to have one major classical feature, and that would have been a large dome over top. Unfortunately, um, the beginnings of the dome while they were being built were structurally unsound. The entire 
structure started shifting and they had to get rid of the dome that they were building and redesign the top of the, the structure. This was a controversial decision. At the time, uh, the new capital was being built between 1867 and 1899. Capitals were expected to have domes. A capital without a dome was perceived to be less than. Um, domed capitals were the rule, not the exception. And currently there are 26 state capital buildings with domes standing today, um, including our near neighbors, Connecticut, Maine, Massachusetts, New Jersey, Rhode Island, Vermont, making us rather the, the Northeast outlier there. But outside of the Capitol building, Albany had numerous other structures that followed this neoclassical ideal. Um, so the first one that we see here is Old State Hall. It's one of the few buildings we'll discuss today not designed by Philip Hooker. And it was built in 1797 and was the first public building created by the new state government following the American Revolution. Its purpose was to house state offices, including the Attorney General and the Executive Chamber. It was a smaller building than the old state capitol. And because of this very small size, um, that is why the, the old state capitol was eventually built and took over housing these offices. So when old state hall became obsolete as a space for legislative and executive offices, it became an official collections repository for the state cabinet of natural history, which was the predecessor of the New York State Museum. And this was all before the building's demolition in 1855. Philip Hooker was integ integral in the design and construction of other New York State buildings, including the New York State Arsenal in 1799 and Old Albany City Hall in 1832. The Arsenal had all the austerity and symmetry that one would expect from an early federal building. It was visually utilitarian, but fit for its pur practical purpose to store arms. It was meant to be very practical inside but still have the refined look of the other Albany surrounding it in, of the other buildings surrounding it in Albany. Old Albany City Hall was a multi-story columned building. It took approximately three years to build and boasted its own impressive dome atop the building, falling in line with the rest of Albany's skyline at the time. Neither of these buildings exist today either. City Hall was raised in the 1880s and the arsenal was repurposed in 1857 before being eventually demolished in the 1960s. Also within Albany, the Mechanics and Farmers Bank built in 1811 and the New York State Bank built in 1803 also had similar facades. Um, they had columns across the entrance, prominent domes on top, and the Albany City Jail as well was similarly neoclassical, but with the exclusion of columns down the front. So the existence of all these neoclassical buildings, I think furthers the prevalence of classical motifs within this political and civic sphere, but while also seeing them in uh, parts of society that were outside strictly political areas, jails, banks, you had finance, all adopting the same, uh, same looks. So outside of the capital, there's a lot more to New York than Albany. Um, we get even more examples of neoclassical architecture, and there are far too many for me to cover during this short little talk. So I've just taken a couple. Um, so first we have Hyde Hall in Otsego County in Cooperstown, essentially. Um, it was a private residence built for George Clark and designed by Philip Hooker, once again. He designed this manor on property that Clark had purchased to neighbor his wife's family's estate. And construction began in 1817, but wasn't completed until almost two decades later in 1834, one year before George Clark died. As you can see from this photo, it has the columns um, the portico, uh, you can't really tell from the photo here, but same symmetrical ideals that we see in these other buildings. 
And then just cr across the river from Albany, we have in Rensselaer County, what used to be an entire military garrison that was built to house soldiers during the War of 1812. The Greenbush Cantonment, as it came to be called, was created between the years 1812 and 1815 and built in the same neoclassical style. While at first look, it might not look like it has the grandeur or the opulent features of these other neoclassical buildings that come to mind when we hear that phrase neoclassical, the pseudo sort of columns along the front and the symmetry certainly allude to these classical architectural forms. This property in its heyday held eight barracks, four officers barracks, an arsenal, storehouses, as well as its own hospital. It was numerous buildings um, across acres and acres of land. Unfortunately, most of these buildings no longer exist. The only one in existence now is one of the officers barracks, which you can see pictured here, which is now a private residence. So outside of architecture, there are a lot of other things connected to the state capital, connected to the founding of the United States that we can also see taking these classical forms and adopting them to their very own. And the most prominent, I think, would be the New York State Seal. Um, it was originally adopted in 1778 and it remains largely unchanged today. You can't tell this from this picture because it's black and white. Um, but generally today, this is seen on a blue background. The only major change was adopting that, that blue background. It used to be a buff background, sort of an off-white color. The image itself, it's full of classical imagery. At the top of the seal is an eagle atop a globe with its wings outstretched, facing towards the Western, Western Hemisphere, where the United States would be depicted. And I discussed classical personifications earlier on, um, and two of these personifications are included within the state seal, the figures of liberty and justice flanking the central image. And they're drawn in classical dress, which is how we usually picture these figures, liberty and justice today. The figure of liberty is holding the classical Frisian cap also known as a liberty cap, which was a Roman symbol of freedom generally given to manumitted slaves. Um, justice is seen holding the scales of justice, similar to the goddess Themis, who was atop the old state capital. She was usually depicted holding scales as well. Municipalities, um, as Jennifer mentioned earlier, there are tons of municipalities within New York State that took classical names and made them their own. Athens, Brutus, Cato, Cincinnatus, Greece, Ithaca, Minerva, Troy, Utica. These were all municipalities incorporated, chartered, or founded between the 1780s and the 1830s and exemplify the wide reach and the permanence of this classical influence on the legitimizing of United States within New York borders. And street names as well. Um, I still have a little more research to do on this. Um, so most of my street name knowledge right now is solely Albany based. Um, but before the American Revolution, there were major streets in Albany that were named for the titles of British aristocrats. You had King Street, Queen, Prince, Duke. And then after the revolution, you see this movement away from these aristocratic names. And these same streets became known as Lion, Elk, State, Eagle. And from slides before, Lion and Eagle to major Roman images um, that don't necessarily have a New York feel to them. You don't see a lot of lions around New York. Um, but they had this classical weight to them. So as we can see from all these examples, um, I hope the, the architecture, the geographical names, imagery used across New York State in the Capitol, outside of the Capitol, in private residencies, 
civic buildings. Um, they all alluded to this grandeur that the classics had during this time and contributed to New York and the wider American establishment. Um, so thank you so much. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to put them into the chat and I'd be happy to answer anything that you have. Okay, we have one question. Okay, I don't know if you could hear the question, um, but asking about other examples outside of architecture where these symbols can be found, um, looking at art and literature. There are definitely examples of that. If you look at portraits of, um, say George Washington, for example, um, the poses that these figures are painted in are evocative of Roman orators, um, sort of this very stoic uh, stance, um, as well as sometimes if you look at the books within these portraits, um, it's classical works um, or eagles within portraits, columns in the background, um, as well as there was a huge shift in portraiture of women pre-revolution and post-revolution. Um, pre-revolution, it's a lot more flowery and women are holding pearls or fruit or flowers in their lap to put a greater emphasis on um, fertility and the fact that they're young and beautiful and very eligible. After the revolution, you have a greater emphasis on this idea of Republican motherhood, where women are responsible for um, raising the next generation and the, you know, the next founding fathers. And they're seen with, um, with books more austere, austere, excuse me, um, uh, backgrounds, that sort of thing. And also in statues, there's a statue outside of the Alfred E. Smith building here in Albany. Um, it's a copy of a statue made by Jean-Antoine Houdon, which is in the Virginia capital, but a copy was made and uh, it, uh, dedicated, I believe in 1932, I think as part of the 150th anniversary events for the American Revolution. And that statue depicts George Washington as Cincinnatus, who was a well-known Roman senator who decided at the end of a battle or his commission that he was going to retire. He didn't want any more power. He didn't want another commission. He just wanted to go back to his farm. Um, so uh, there were a lot of comparisons to George Washington Cincinnatus at the time, um, hence the statue. All right, any other questions? Oh, uh, would theaters of the late 18th and early 19th century also reflect Roman influences in early America? Um, yes. Uh, so let me see. There were a number of plays um, popular at the time the one that comes to mind is a play called Cato. And it was about a, a Roman figure by the same name. Um, and that burst in popularity uh, during the American Revolution. I believe that there was a performance of it or a reading of some sort um, put on at Valley Forge. I could have that, have that mixed up. Um, but I do believe that um, there was a performance of that at Valley Forge. It was a favorite play of George Washington. Um, and I, I'm sure that there were others. I just can't bring them off the top of my head. Um, but even um, the construction of theaters actually was very much based on classical forms. Um, the, the shapes of theaters, the way that they were built um, was very similar to ancient Roman or ancient Greek theaters as well. Okay. All right, anything else? 
are there any examples of retrofitting existing buildings to show a more neoclassical style? That is an excellent question. Um, I'm sure over time, you know, if you're part of a, a grand family and you have this beautiful neoclassical building, but then time goes by and you redecorate and you renovate, um, interiors of these buildings might look very different, maybe have a more Victorian feel. Um, but as some of these buildings become historic landmarks or museums, um, they become reinterpreted to go back to maybe their original look. Um, I think Hyde Hall went through quite a significant restoration period where they tried to bring everything back to its original neoclassical look. All right, and we've still got a few minutes. Another question out there. Um, well, I guess another way, if, if add a little bit more as we wait for any more questions. Um, another way that these classical influences could be seen. Um, so everybody learns about the Federalist Papers in school. Um, written by Alexander Hamilton, John Jay, and James Madison. Um, but they didn't sign their actual names to those papers. Um, they all wrote those under the same byline, I guess you could say. Um, and that was a classical pseudonym, uh, Publius, I believe. Uh, I'm not entirely sure how to pronounce it, but that was based off of a hero of ancient Rome who really founded the Republic and destroyed the Roman aristocracy and created the, the Roman Republic as we understand it today. And um, they thought, well, we have a similar venture here. We have a similar goal. We want to create this new Republic, uh, get rid of the, the British monarchy. And that is the name that we'll adopt for this public facing um, campaign really. Um, well, I don't think we have any more questions, um, but if you come up with something later on, feel free to contact me through the New York State Museum. And, uh, thank you so much for attending. Have a wonderful rest of your day.